it on? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me. Je m'appelle Philippe. Uh, je, je travaille à Akamai. Uh, je ne parle pas bien français, donc uh, je vais parler en anglais. <laughs> Mais si vous avez des questions en français, vous pouvez demander uh, plus long, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> um, Today I'm going to speak about uh, metrics that matter. So like I uh, was introduced, uh, I work on a JavaScript tool called Boomerang. And uh, right at the moment, I work on data analysis for the data we collect using Boomerang. So this talk is primarily going to be about uh, the data we've collected, how we've analyzed it, and uh, I will touch a little bit on how we actually collected it. There have been a lot of talks today, starting with uh, JP's talk right in the morning that already introduced a lot of the metrics that matter. So that actually makes my job easier. I can skip over that. So I will not be doing a one and a half hour talk. I will be doing a 40 minute talk. <laughs> All right. So my. Uh, I'm Blues Moon on Twitter and also on GitHub. The Boomerang library is open source. It's on GitHub. Uh, you can't see the URL here, but if you click on that, it'll take you to github.com slash Akamai slash Boomerang. Uh, so feel free to download it, read through the source code, read through the documentation. That might actually cover 90% of my talk uh, just by looking at the documentation. So what we've been trying to do uh, as part of the Boomerang team and the data science uh, team that works on uh, analyzing this data is kind of split into two parts, the, what I call the art and science of RUM. Um, the science part is really working with the browser, trying to collect the data and trying to just make sure there's no bugs in the data. Has anybody worked with browsers here? You notice uh, some of them have bugs, right? In fact, a lot of them have bugs, and when you work on a large scale, like uh, collecting a lot of data, we've, uh, I just looked at one week of data, it was about 80 million data points, and there are a lot of bugs in there. Okay, so just trying to filter that out, um, collecting the data without getting any bugs in there is uh, part of the interesting parts of, uh, of what we do. And then is the, the art part is just trying to figure out, make sense of that, staring at data points for a long, large amount of time has anybody ever stared at logs for a long time? Just try to figure out what's going on with your system, right? Uh, take that and scale it uh, to a large number of data points, right? If you just look at an Apache log, it tells you request time and stuff. We look at about 245 individual measurements per data point that we collect. So trying to figure out correlations between all of this is has been interesting. And so we don't look at all of things at once. We look at them individually to get some interesting data points. So what we came up with uh, over the last several years, we've been working on this project for uh, about 10 years, I'd say. It's been open source for seven, uh, eight of those years. We've been trying to figure out what to measure. We started out with very simply measure the onload event because that's the easiest thing to measure. Right? It requires the least amount of code. It exists in all browsers from uh, IE 2.0 onwards. So really, if you want to measure everything that supports JavaScript, then you use the onload event. The problem is that was not really the best measure, um, and JP's already touched on why that was not the best measure. So we, we came about, like, let's figure out some new things. And once you figure out what else you want to measure, how do you go about measuring it? So what we ended up with is we need to measure the user's emotional state. Right? How does the user feel when they come to your site? How do they feel when they leave your site? How, do, how does using your site make them feel? Does it make them feel more angry? Does it make them feel more frustrated? Or does it make them feel more delighted? Does it make them feel, hey, I want to come back to this site and I want to buy something. Here, take my money. Right? That's, that's really what you want to know as a site owner. Can I design my site to make the experience more, uh, more interesting, more pleasurable? And so we started out trying to figure out how do we measure emotion? So it turns out that uh, we've, we've done some other research, and uh, there's a link there to uh, that talk, that a user's actual emotional state affects how they browse your site. So their state either caused by offline activities or caused by your site itself. Uh, the way we measured that was to look at a sporting event. 
and to compare the real-time activity of the sport with uh, how people were browsing the site and see how they reacted to performance degradation as well as errors on the site. And there was a very strong correlation. Every time a particular team did really well, the users from that country became very tolerant of errors. And if their team was doing badly, they became non-tolerant at all. So they started leaving the site. So there was a strong correlation. And uh, we decided we need to measure more. We can't rely on offline statistics. So we looked at a couple of ways of measuring emotion. We have tried some of these. Uh, we have not tried all of them. So the simplest is ask the user, right? You go to a website, and sometimes you get a pop-up saying, would you like to participate in a survey? Right? Would you like to tell us your browsing experience at the end of this? And you click yes or you click no. If you click yes, they will. once you're leaving the site, they will give you a little form to fill out. Um, you can look at bounce rate or conversion rate, or what we call the LD50 or the median lethal dose. Um, does anybody come from the biological sciences field? All right. If not, then I will explain the, the median lethal dose uh, in, uh, when you're doing cancer research is uh, if you take a, develop a drug and you pass it on to your cells, uh, what is the strength of that drug that kills off 50% of your cancer cells? Right? Or if you're dealing with mice, what is the drug that kills 50% of your mice? So it's called the median lethal dose. In our case, what is the load time that kills off 50% of your users? 50% right? of them bounce. So looking at those kinds of engagement metrics is interesting from the business point of view because most businesses already understand bounce rate, they understand conversion rate, and LD50 is an extension of that. The problem is it is not a direct measurement. So it's inferring users' emotion based on whether they bought or not. But do you always go to a website with the intention of buying something or completing a task? I know when I use a website, for example, on my phone, I will uh, browse through it, I'll be doing research somewhere, but I will wait till I go home to actually do the sale to go enter my credit card details. So maybe I will look like a bounce on my phone, but I will look like a conversion on my laptop, right? So even though I'm the same user. So that's not necessarily giving me a good indication of, um, of my uh, emotional state. Then there's the ones that we're, we're going to look at today, rage clicks and cursor thrashing. So I won't talk about them now, I'll talk about them in a little later. And then facial analysis, right? You look at somebody's face, you can tell kind of their emotion. Uh, and best of all, wireless brain interface, right? Why not just tie into people's uh, brain waves and figure out how they, how they feel about your site? So, so rage clicks is something I'm going to talk about a lot today. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what the definition is. So when a user rapid fire clicks on a particular link, okay, not single clicking, not double clicking, but three, four, five, 135 times on the same link um, in a very short amount of time. It's almost like they're trying to, you know, they're trying to do something, they're not getting a reaction, so they're getting so frustrated there, like punching, 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 trying to get a, a reaction. And it's the, the digital equ equivalence of cursing. You know, you, you scream out uh, some bad words uh, when you're, you're working, but doing it on the mouse, you'd, that's, that's the equivalent. And it turns out there is some research that shows the, the kind of hormones released uh, into your brain when you curse and when you rage click are about the same. So people feel the same amount of release by, by doing rage clicking. So is that something we can measure? And it turns out that, yeah, because you know, mouse movements has been one of the earliest things you can capture with JavaScript. So capturing rage, rage clicking is something we can do. And uh, the other one was cursor thrashing. So cursor thrashing is uh, another interesting one. There was a research done at a university where this person, um, they got a whole bunch of users into a lab. So this research was done with a lab. They had video cameras over everybody, and they measured them from the front, from the top. Uh, and what they did was they first uh, made the users angry. Well, they had 50% of the users, they made them angry. 50% of them, they left them uh, without any change. Uh, the way they made them angry was they made them play a game where they were definitely going to lose. And they told them that this game is very important to the next step, that you're going to get some credits out of it and stuff. And then they made them go to the next step where they actually measured how they use the mouse. And it turns out when a user is frustrated or angry or confused, they start moving the mouse slower. 
which is the opposite of what you think. You think if you're angry, you're going to like shake the mouse a lot, but it turns out when you're actually, that's if you're doing it deliberately, you might, but if you're doing it subconsciously, you're actually trying to complete a task, you end up moving the mouse more slower and more jerky. So you'll have long periods with no activity, and then there'll be a jerk, but it'll be slow, and so on. And so we said, let's also try and measure that kind of uh, interaction and see can we correlate it with, uh, with our user behavior. Uh, facial analysis and mind reading, we're not, we're not doing this, uh, but I'm just putting it out there. There's open source libraries for web, uh, this thing called Webalizer, and uh, there's a tool called Emotive. Boomerang is open source, so if anybody wants to build a plugin, <laughs> that's up to you. Links are available, right? Uh, we also do not do this, asking the user. That's, uh, I flew in from Schiphol yesterday, and I went to the restroom and got that prompt there just as I was leaving. So I thought, it's uh, hey, they're asking me, but I am not going to give feedback because uh, the selection bias, and I'm selecting out of this particular, uh, this particular survey. Uh, so selection bias is one of the reasons why we don't ask the user. The only people who will opt into answering this are people who really feel strongly about uh, their experience. Um, then there's something called the Hawthorne effect. So the Hawthorne effect is when you tell somebody that they're being measured, that you're looking at uh, what their experience was, they immediately change how they react to that experience. So if uh, they were originally going to be frustrated, but you tell them, hey, I'm going to see how frustrated you are, they will try very hard not to be frustrated. Right? And that is uh, basically biases your results against it. And lastly, it's an intrusive action. So as Boomerang is a JavaScript library, it's something that uh, we provide as a third party. We cannot uh, change all of our customers' websites to say, hey, we're going to ask the user a question. Right? The, the customer needs to decide on their own if they want to do that. So we don't, uh, we don't do anything intrusive. Everything Boomerang collects has to be done passively uh, without affecting the, the user's browsing experience. So let's get back to measuring of rage clicks. So very easy to measure it. It's in JavaScript. You hook on to the uh, on click event, or in our case, we actually use the on mouse down event because that's a little more reliable with uh, capturing mouse clicks and then movements and stuff. So capture that, look for any kind of clicks that happen multiple times on the same uh, event, uh, on the same element, or within 10 pixels of the, of the same uh, element. And we capture event or timestamp to see at what point that was clicked. So if more than two clicks happen in a very short amount of time within 100 milliseconds or, uh, uh, and well, depending on how many clicks, then the amount of time increases, we will then register that as a rage click. And we store that in a, a queue, so you actually get rage clicks across the, the lifetime of the page. And um, the code is in Boomerang's continuity plugin. I'm not going to list it here because it's a couple of pages of JavaScript to do that. But essentially, we collect it that way. It turns out that um, the likelihood of somebody rage clicking is, depends on the latency of page usability. So at this point, I'm, I'm measuring a couple of different events. Uh, I don't know if it's all visible down at the bottom. I'm going to read them out, so don't worry too much. We have a couple of different events in the lifetime of the page. And how badly somebody rage clicks or how much they rage click tends to depend on when the page became interactive. So the first bar we have here is when the page became interactive before, oh, sorry, the page, yeah, page became interactive before the user's first interaction. So when they actually tried to interact, the page was already interactive. Uh, it's a little lower. It's not the highest. In the second case, the first interaction was before the page became interactive. So uh, the user tried to interact with it, click or move the mouse, uh, scroll the mouse, or enter a key press, uh, but the page was not yet ready to accept that. And that's when we see more rage clicks tend to happen. Uh, the third one is where the page load happened before the user interaction. And there we see the lowest instance of rage clicks. There are still rage clicks, even if they interact after page load. But if page load happens before the user's first interaction, then there are very few rage clicks. And the most rage clicks are if the first interaction happens uh, before page load. So it doesn't matter where interactive happens at that point, whether interactive happened uh, between the two or after page load, 
but if they interact with the site just before page load, we get a large number of rage clicks. So we, we tried to figure out why that happened. And uh, we also noticed in over 30% of cages, uh, cases, the page is interactive after onload, and in 15% of those cases, uh, this last one, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this, that's a breakdown of this last one, right? The users try to interact uh, off, between onload and interactive. So they think the page is loaded, they try to interact, but the page is not ready for that. And there can be various reasons for that. Most commonly is JavaScript event handlers, where you attach an event to a link. A user tries to click on the link, but that event is not ready to fire yet. Uh, the other thing could be CPU busy. So we'll, we'll try and look at uh, some of the other reasons. Uh, so this is another chart uh, I pulled up about um, the, the likelihood of rage clicking depending on when the user first interactive relative, uh, interacted relative to when the page became interactive. That's the top chart. And when the page uh, had its onload event file, that's the bottom chart. And we find some very interesting things. So um, before the page becomes interactive, if the users try interacting with the page, there's a fairly consistent uh, rate of rage clicking. So it's not a large amount, but it's fairly consistent. Some users will try to interact. We even find some people try to interact with the pages before there's anything on screen. So before are uh, immediately at visually ready, which um, really they, they think things are ready or they're getting impatient and they want to interact with it. Um, but we find that immediately after the page becomes interactive, that number of rage clicks starts dropping uh, with a linear correlation. And then it goes back to its steady state right after that. So most users feel that they can interact with the site at that point, but if they can't for whatever reason, then they start getting frustrated and clicking a lot more. When we look at page load, the, the correlation is just before the page load event. So most people rage click just before the page load event. And we looked at this a little more, and it turns out that in many sites, they have a, uh, an event handler on document ready, which fires just before the page load event. And typically, that might use up a lot of CPU. There might be a lot of busy activity happening there. So if the user tries to interact at that point, then the, page, uh, the browser is busy on CPU, right? It's busy executing this out of the JavaScript, and it cannot actually respond to that click or the mouse movement, or, uh, sorry, mouse scroll or the key press. And so the user gets, tries to click, they get no response, they click again and again and again. So that's where we see the most amount. And then there's a steady state after onload, which is interesting. There's actually more rage clicks after onload than before onload. Um, the most likely reason is because there are more people trying to click after onload than there are people trying to click before onload. So that's why we just have more after that. Uh, steady state because there is probably more JavaScript running at that point whenever the user does an interaction. It may not be as smooth. Uh, I should mention that this data is from across uh, 51 websites, so not uh, a single website. So uh, it's not a large number amount of data. This was uh, about 2 million data points uh, sampled from the, the full set that I got. Right. So um, uh, there's, it's also interesting, I should mention here, that when we split this by desktop versus mobile, there was more likelihood of rage clicking on mobile than on desktop. And uh, we tend to see more blurred lines here on the, uh, for mobile, where users will rage click all over the place. And that's uh, you know, really trying to tap. It could also be they feel you know, sometimes a link is too small to click on. So you tap on it with your finger, but your finger is too large, and you click on the wrong thing. Uh, we actually call those missed clicks. Um, but a missed click can lead to a rage click, because you click once, you think you missed it. You click again. You double click, the thing zooms up, and it gets more and more frustrating. So we really find much more rage clicking happening on mobile devices than on desktops. And uh, I'll make these slides available. There is a slide of that right at the end of the presentation. That, uh, if there's time, I will show it. So uh, now that we know that uh, rage clicking happens, there is a, it's relative to when first interaction happens. What really is the optimum time? Uh, well, first, what is the optimum timer to use? And then what's the optimum time to reduce rage clicking? So we did some more analysis of just uh, comparing uh, <clears throat> the amount of rage clicking when other timers are relative to visually ready. 
So we looked at all different timers, uh, the ratio of a timer to visually ready. So on load divided by visually ready, first interactive divided by visually ready, uh, and all the other timers. And it turns out the most likely uh, correlation is with uh, first interaction divided by visually ready. When your first interaction is between 1.2x and 1.5x of your visual, visually ready time, users are most likely to rage click. Which, uh, it's, it's interesting to think that there might be causation here. So remember, this is a correlation chart, not implying that one affects the other. What's more likely is that a user sees a page ready and they mentally they have a countdown started from that point saying, OK, I think I can interact with it now. And that countdown seems to be 1.2 times, which is, uh, let's say you have a 2.4 second a visually ready time, right? That's 2.4 into 1.2 is what's uh, 2.8 or 2.9 seconds. So that's that's basically when they expect to be able to interact with the page. And if your page is not ready to be interacted with at that time, so first interactive or onload or whatever event you care about, if that is not ready at that point of time, you're going to increase the number of rage clicks. You're going to increase user frustration at that point. So um, make sure your page is interactive at that point of time. If you think you have busy uh, a lot of JavaScript that's using up a lot of CPU that you put in your DOM ready event, and that's pushing your interactive out later, it makes sense to actually defer that JavaScript. So figure out exactly what JavaScript you need, you absolutely need for the user to be able to interact with your site, and defer everything else. Let it run in uh, you know request idle callback or uh, some other time later on in the page's lifecycle. And uh, I should mention, we don't know why users react this way. We just know that this is what the data has told us. So we haven't sat in a lab with users to ask them what they, what they feel and why they're doing that. Right. So the next thing, uh, any questions about rage clicking so far? Because I'm going to move on to uh, the next topic. And this is the one I had most data about. So this questions, uh, feel free to ask me right now. Can we use that? Can we somehow export that rage click data to have it kind of per user? To <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the, the question is stuff. about exporting uh, rage click data to have it per user. Uh, so the answer is yes and no. Uh, theoretically, it is possible to do it per user. Okay. Uh, practically, we tend not to track users because. If we were to actually attach this data to user identifiable metrics, so I can't identify you. I can say a user in yeah. uh, who's in Bordeaux today has done this. But if I try to track it, track it to you, then somebody else, let's say tomorrow some government issues a warrant saying, hey, I want this guy's activity, I would be able to tell him that you were frustrated. And, <laughs> and that he's angry. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that may not be something. Or you know, maybe somebody compromises a. Uh, logs. <laughs> there, there could be various reasons we don't want to identify a single user. But if you were to implement Boomerang yourself, there's nothing stopping you from yeah. doing that. Right? Uh, any other questions with rage clicks? All right, so I will move on. So it, with cursor thrashing, I'm not actually going to show data, mainly because we haven't yet figured out how to visualize it properly. So. Cursor thrashing is, uh, again, the moving of the mouse. We measure that. It's fairly easy to measure. You hook onto the on mouse move event, and you use set timeout every, uh, either when there is a mouse movement or every 100 milliseconds. We log an event saying the user moved the mouse this many uh, pixels uh, from the last point. And then we uh, analyze that later on to see was that a fast movement, was that a slow movement, was it a jerky movement, et cetera do that per user and then sort of assign a, a category to that user, right? We, we don't know yet what the actual thresholds are because we don't have video cameras sitting above every user to measure uh, what they're feeling, but we can use that, the research that's already been done to say uh, we have some idea of what this is. Uh, again, I don't want to draw any conclusions from this because we, we don't know too many details about uh, what that is, we can just say that it was a slow movement, it was a jerky movement, and so on. We, we're not going to project that onto emotions yet. So there are some key differences between rage clicking and cursor thrash thrashing that uh, we need to be aware of when doing the analysis. 
uh, rage clicks in particular, the user's response to your site. So it does not necessarily matter how they were feeling before they came to your site. It's more like rage clicking is something your site has caused them to feel frustrated about, and therefore uh, you got rage clicks. Um, there might also be false positives with rage clicks, right? Sometimes you're, like, especially if you're using a trackpad, uh, sometimes your finger just moves down and you click, right? I do that all the time, and I end up selecting some text when I actually wanted to scroll. And so there are going to be false positives, but in aggregate, you're looking at millions of data points, you, you feel that the false positives are going to go away and the, the real bad ones are going to show up. Uh, in the case of cursor thrashing, it's uh, indicative of the user's experience before they got to that page. So one of the things we might want to do is uh, either use that as signal saying uh, this was the user state. If we can be uh, confident enough in the measurements saying this was the user state and modify a browsing experience accordingly, right? If you think they're already coming in a little frustrated, maybe give them a more incentive, maybe give them a discount coupon, maybe load a lighter version of your page so it loads faster. Um, but another thing you can do is measure this from page to page, right? Can you see if the user's level of frustration is increasing as they go through your site or is it reducing as they go through your site? And that is uh, an indication of something you can pass back to your design, your user interaction team or your user experience team saying, hey, I think this flow is causing uh, users to be frustrated, can we simplify it or can we do some user research and figure out a better way of doing that? So that's something we can, uh, we can do with cursor thrashing. All right. So now, now that we've talked about uh, how we want to actually use the data, uh, let's go into the definitions of uh, all of these terms we've used. So JP has talked about many of them from uh, an overall point of view. I'll specifically talk about them from Boomerang's point of view. Uh, definitions might be slightly different. So the, the timers that we care about in terms of uh, what we're calling metrics that matter or continuity metrics, visually ready, which is when the user felt they could uh, interact with the site. Interactive is after the page was visually ready, when was the first time a user could interact and, and have a good experience. So if they could, you can probably interact at visually ready, but you might have a bad experience. So. When was the experience going to be good? First interaction is simply when was the first mouse, uh, mouse click, key press, or scroll. Uh, that's what we consider an interaction. And first input delay, uh, it's something uh, Rick mentioned a little earlier, is when the user tries to, uh, the first time that a user tried to interact with the site, how long, what was the latency between the response, the actual interaction and the response to that. So we measure that. We also measure all the other interactions on the site uh, as long as it's before our beacon was sent and uh, what was the latency of that. Then uh, other interaction metrics, uh, delayed interactions, so not just first, in, in first input delay, but uh, all the interaction delays. Rage clicks, like I just mentioned, and mouse movements in order to measure cursor thrashing. And then page performance metrics, which uh, we consider low-level metrics. So in the past, these were the things we were concentrating completely on because they were easy to measure. Uh, right now we consider these very basic metrics that we will use to calculate better things. So frame rate, um, long task data, and page busy. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, each of these a little later. Page busy, uh, yeah. So how do we measure what matters? Right. So far we've spoken about what they are. Simplest case, use Boomerang, right? Boomerang does it all for you. Put it into your page, you'll just get a beacon back with all of the data, and then you read the documentation to figure out all of the, I don't know, at this point it's probably 375 different uh, points that you'll get. I know I said 245, that was before we added uh, these metrics. Uh, oh, there's a talk we've done. So Nick and I were two main developers on Boomerang. We did a talk at Velocity, that's a 90 minute talk, which includes all of the source code that we developed and how we developed it. Or uh, I'll just talk about it now without any source code because it's really hard to see source code on a screen like this. <laughs> so how do you measure visually ready? Uh, there's a couple of timers you can use. We try and make it work so that it works with all browsers, even those that don't necessarily support all of these times. So first paint, which is uh, either from the paint timing API or 
In the case of uh, old Internet Explorer browsers, there's something called MS First Paint that comes in through navigation timing. Then First Contentful Paint, which is again from the Paint Timing API, and DOM Content Loaded. <laughs> so those are three events that we use. Then we look for hero images. So is anyone familiar with hero images? A few people. All right, so uh, Steve Souders had a post uh, a little while ago called uh, Last Action, uh, Last Paint Hero, I think. Uh, last Action Paint Hero. Uh, last Painted Hero, that's what it was. Um, good blog post explains what hero image is about and what you, why you care about them. In short, it's uh, if you have a really large image on the front of your page above the fold, or if you have multiple of those, Whenever the last one of those completes rendering, that's when the user feels that your page is ready. If you, any of those are not completed, you have an empty space there, the user feels the page is not visually ready yet. So that's a hero image, and the last one is a framework ready event. So if you use a web <laughs> framework, AngularJS or React or uh, any of the two million JavaScript frameworks that exist at this point in time, uh, you can specify, they all have an event saying uh, when, any, uh, when a request was completed, so the user typed in or clicked a link or something, they will tell you when that uh, response came back. You can hook into that. You can also, we will do a little more analysis after that, so let's say a response came back and that resulted in some JavaScript or some images being added to the DOM. We will even wait for all of that to complete loading and then say, all right, we think we're ready now. We'll pick the last event of all of these and that's when the user thinks the page is visually ready. So naturally, we'll be more accurate the more APIs your browser supports. Uh, Chrome has probably the best API support for all of these, so. Uh, you can, of course, expect all your users to use Chrome, but for others, you will have a, a fallback. Time to interactive. We measure frame rate using request animation frame. Request animation frame is supposed to fire every time the browser is ready to draw something on screen. If that fires at a regular interval, you mean it means you are not using too much CPU. If that is too janky, then it's bad. Um, measure long tasks using the Performance Observer API. I will actually show source code of, of that a little later. And measure page busy using set interval. So we do just do set interval and something like uh, 32 milliseconds. So a callback that fires every 32 milliseconds, and then we will measure if it actually fired 32 milliseconds since the last one. If it did, took longer than 32 milliseconds, that means the browser was CPU busy during that time. So using that, we can tell if, uh, if the page was busy. And interaction latency is very simply attach an event handler to a key press and mouse movement and, sorry, mouse click and scroll events and measure how long it takes. And the first period of half a second that has um, no long tasks, greater than 20 millisecond FPS, uh, sorry, greater than 20 FPS, and uh, less than 10% page busy, that's considered time to interactive. Uh, delayed interactions, I don't need to talk too much about this. Everybody's been writing uh, event handlers for clicks and stuff, friends. Well, hopefully since you started doing web development. <laughs> for me, that was in 1996. <laughs> um, that's not necessarily how old I am. <laughs> uh, frame rate, like, uh, using request animation frame, just measure the time difference between two request uh, animation frame calls. If that is 16 milliseconds or lower, it means you have a very good frame rate. If that is above 16 milliseconds, the user's gonna have a bad experience. Uh, the problem is this measurement is ex expensive and it uses a battery. So if your, your page is otherwise idle, we say don't do this measurement. Uh, do this measurement only when your page is actually busy. Right? Long tasks, the only slide with source code on my, uh, in my presentation. So something called a performance observer. You attach an observer saying observe .ob uh, observer.observe and the type of entries. In our case, we wanna look at long task entries. And then your callback gets uh, a bunch of uh, entries saying which task, uh, rather how long a task took if a task took more than 50 milliseconds to execute, and which uh, JavaScript source file and line number actually caused that. So it's pretty good in pointing back to your actual code saying this particular code is slow and causing a lot of interaction delay for users. So in summary, measure what uh, affects your user's emotion when using your website. Right? 
reduce the amount of work you have to do in event handlers just before the, the onload event um, and in the ready state event. And me measure the responsiveness and smoothness of your user UI while your UI is being updated. Right? 